Hey everybody, I'm sitting here with my artist, brother in spirit, Mr. LaShawn B, all the way from Houston, Texas, outside of Houston. There it is. And we're just uh, fellowshipping after a weekend of doing um, some, uh, he did a show here at my studio. We also did a celebrity paint party here at the studio, uh, where he had about 40 guests and he gave them an assignment and it went really well. He's also on a tour where he's doing home shows uh, in this region. So we wanted to welcome him to Baltimore. So uh, much. we haven't talked about a lot of things. We've been knowing each other for how long? Oh, wow. Well, over 30, 30 plus years now. Yes, right. 30 yeah. years. I met him here in Baltimore, ironically. So uh, we have a bit of a, of a, of a history. Uh, well, we want to talk a little bit about what's happening in the art business right now and some of the things we're going through right now in our personal businesses. And maybe y'all can spread the word around to people. Uh, Deshaun, what do you say... Was the one thing you learned about, you know, the the, the art market between 1985 and, say, 1995, uh, when this movement really started? Well, back in 85, man, we were all so green. And uh, the market was just ripe for us to fall in. And people were excited about their Afrocentric culture, uh, particularly... Uh, collecting African American art, so uh, it had its challenges without a doubt, but uh, it was really smooth selling for several years there, and it was just a matter of being out there and exposing yourself to the people. Yeah, well, you know, for what I can remember, you know, in nineteen, I started my business in nineteen eighty five, so I started doing a lot of the trade shows in New York City, and a lot of the poster and frame shops would come to that show. To purchase works for their gallery right. and so I initially started off doing the publishing business before I actually knew about some of the other components that went with the art business but back then everybody was hungry for their culture and I think mm -hmm. now we're talking about a generation later uh, 30 years is a long time and so the sensibilities I think are shifting the business certainly have shifted because man from 1985 to about 99 most African American artists were making more money than they'd ever made in their entire lives. True, <laughs> true, true. And God forbid, had we had invested that money <laughs> in some other things, we'd all be doing real well right now. But with that being said, we're all uh, keeping it alive. We're connecting to people. Yes. Uh, what do you think about, was the biggest thing we did in the '80s and '90s uh, for this market? What was one of the biggest things we accomplished outside of making artwork accessible? Well, first and foremost, we brought our culture and our consciousness for culture to mainstream, to the people. So we gave them what they were looking for, you know, something that would build up their self-esteem and uh, just ecstatically make their living spaces more pleasant. You know, the thing about accessibility, and you know, the biggest thing that happened between 1985 and 99 was that uh, technology made a lot of things accessible. Because prior to that period, no artist could afford to publish their work. Um, there, was, there were no venues available. There were none of the mega art shows that we used to participate in, like the National Black Arts right. Festival, um, October Gallery. Um, Black Heritage. Well, who, who else can you think of that was really doing these large mega shows in these different cities? Oh well, you named pretty much named them yeah. all. But you and had so, uh, mm -hmm. in Atlanta, you had the the Heritage Show there, right? And then uh, on the West Coast, you had the, the uh, Baldwin Hills Baldwin Hill show. show so, right? Man, those uh, we say those were the heydays. Yeah, it was. It was a real uh, foundation period for us because not only were we uh, we had a venue. I mean, my dad was an artist. He didn't have a venue. He came along in the 60s. There was nothing available for him to do. And because of the accessibility of technology, he couldn't pre reproduce his work. Nobody was thinking about it. They were just, just glad to be able to show their work, mm -hmm. let alone sell their work. And so here we come. Boom. You know, if you look at your, your, your common printer and you see how far we've come, you know, now we can go to a printer and we, we were able to go and, and publish our works. And I think making it accessible... Uh, probably was the biggest thing that happened. You know, they've never really coined a phrase for what happened between 90, 89, 85 and 99. 
Uh, some people are using these terms like golden age of African American art. Some of them are using the popular artists, whatever it is. Um, that period was a pivotal period. It so, was. It was. You know. So, what do you think was uh, one of the biggest challenges you had making the transition into doing this full time? Because that's another thing. We're both full time artists. Now, he had a, a military history. So, when I met him, he was just coming out of the military. So, mm-hmm. uh, tell me a little bit of what that was like when you came out and, and really tried to, to jumpstart this thing. Well, the biggest challenge was really, uh, and from us. Artists in that period, and even to this very day, was having uh, someone or some ones that could uh, handle your artwork for you via publishing or or distribution of the artwork, as well as um, places to exhibit exhibit the work. Uh, I think for me, it was purely for me. It's fairly easy. The transition was fairly easy for me. Because I had been working on it so long, you know, back when I was here. So by the time I got to, got left here, went to uh, Texas, it was just a matter of years of just perfecting some things and uh, and getting the work out there. Fortunately enough for me, I, you know, picked up a, a publisher and uh, it skyrocketed uh, from there. So those, those are the challenges, just finding the venues to get your work out there. I and mean, I tell artists all the time, you know, the bottom line is you just got to do it. You got to hook a crook you need to get your work out there yeah i know we all had to learn how to be hustlers because yes. at that period no none of us had any business savvy mm-hmm. <laughs> none of us knew what the business was you know this opening came up and we were trying to figure it out but it was moving a lot faster than most of us could keep up with it but in the process due trial and error most of us forged ourselves into entrepreneurs if nothing else now th- whether we were doing business the way it was traditionally supposed to be done I think that by all the art dealers that surface, all of the uh, the, the uh, publishers that surface around that time, things graphics, uh, mm-hmm. Elba Vargas, uh, uh, um, um, Essence, Golden Enterprise, Essence Art, Golden yeah. Enterprise. It was a yeah. whole group of people who were catering specifically to African American art, and most of those folks are gone. <laughs> yes. yes, you know when nine eleven hit. Let's just put it this way. From 1985 to 1999, I would say, the business had peaked and began to start to come down the hill. Mm -hmm. And nobody was prepared for it. And another thing that happened along with that was uh, this thing called the Internet. Because when this boom happened, the Internet wasn't around. So if you can imagine that time happening with what's happening now with social networking, I don't know where we would be, but you got to take it uh, as it comes. But... uh, Needless to say, nobody predicted the impact of um, what the Internet was going to do to the art business itself. So, like, for instance, he was he was just a brave when broke out there. Um, he wasn't dependent on the dealers. He wasn't dependent on the, on the, on the publishers. He was kind of everybody had these venues and we were just doing these venues. He was always being prolific with his work and he would just show up at these venues. I tried another route where I began to publish my work first and distribute it first. So I learned the whole distribution aspect of the business before I even really understood, okay, this is something I can do. And so with that being said, uh, that that laid the groundwork for a lot of the artists that people who know that are popular, the Charles Bibbs, the Wax, the Frank Morrisons. We can mm-hmm. go down a list, man, a list, yes. of guys, including the women. You got Cynthia St. James. You got Sylvia Walker. You got mm-hmm. um, Karen Buster. You Phyllis. got... Steve Phyllis is, Stevens, yes. you got, you know, it's a host of us. If I left you out, I didn't mean to leave you out, Grace Key, son. Because <laughs> <You know>, <laughs> they were literally... Oh, Morris. Morris <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was literally... Morris a, Evanson. I would say about a good hundred of us that really caught that wave and we rode that wave. And even today, when people talk about African-American art, even though we had this generation shift, our names are still popular enough where people have at least seen our work. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I started in 1995, you go in, you ask 10 people if they had artwork in the house, nobody had none. Now, you ask 10 people if they got artwork in the house, you might find one or two that don't. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know? So, they now... never will. <laughs> now, along the years, we tried a couple of different things, man, because we've crossed paths at different points. Um, like you helped me with a, a project I came up with a couple of years ago called Creative Quarantine. If you haven't heard about it, uh, visit the Creative Quarantine on Facebook and you'll see some of the uh, groupings or I call these uh, residencies 
where artists get together and we do these experimental works. And LaShawn was one of the first, uh, how can I say, we all work from, uh, traditionally the project was artists would meet in one spot and we would just create for a month. I'm talking about three weeks of serious round the clock work and then one week where we would exhibit the work. Okay, it, it slowly evolved to us doing, uh, just calling artists up and having them in mind for that time period. And Deshaun was one of the first artists we tried where Charles Bibbs did his from California. He did his from Texas. I did mine from Baltimore, but we were consciously creating work. What was that like for you, man, to be in that kind of a vibe? I mean, I know you are very prolific in your own space, but what is it like when you're working with other artists and y'all got this invisible energy that's happening with creating work? It is it is something that's profound because it's a learning experience. It's a, a, a it's a major learning experience and, and a creative experience that uh, challenges you. And that's why it's really important to artists to try to uh, experiment with that because it just challenges you to, to grow. What was your biggest challenge? Oh, let's see. What well, the biggest challenge is getting started. <laughs> it's that's the biggest challenge just getting started yeah because what happens in the beginning and now uh, me and charles bibbs founded this probably in 2006 uh and the conversation started between the two of us what would happen if we were able to just not only break away from all the business stuff for a change but when was the last time you had a block of time to just paint yes and we talked about that for probably about five years before we did the first one uh and what we found was pretty tremendous. I mean, when you get artists that are, that are focused on working like that, no distractions, no, no road shows to go to, step away from the phone for a minute, it's amazing how much work you can create in such a short amount of time. Now, because you're doing experimental work, you're not grinding on that one painting and trying to get everything perfect, but the experimentation that happens with you trying to keep up, because what happens is, typically, all right, you agree to do it, <laughs> You look at your calendar, you block it out your time. Uh, we had a list that we would keep track of. And then all of a sudden, we would start posting what we did. And <laughs> tell them what it's like now when you are trying to get started. And then one of the artists in the other state done posted three pictures. <laughs> like, oh, come on, man. It's like, seriously? Come on, I got to keep up with this? I quit. I'm done. <laughs> But, but then, a, you know, that competitor's kicks in. You're like, oh, 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 no, 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 no. I can't I, go out no, like no, that. I can't go out like that. <laughs> Pride won't let that happen. You know, so, yeah. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, we've done it. And so um, uh, I was fortunate enough that and, uh, that when he came through town to do his series of show and his tour and, and the paint party, that we had a chance for the first time to really collaborate because – Collaborating is something a lot of people don't know about that's happening in the African-American art market. Like he was saying about the camaraderie earlier. Artists have a really good camaraderie for the most part. Right. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we all look out for each other. We uh, let each other know what shows are happening. We kind of always vibe on what's happening with the business or mm -hmm. our struggles. Mm -hmm. um, so that part people don't really expect, nor what they really expect for us to really work together. Okay. They, 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 like he used the term competitive, but it's it's a different kind of competition. Right. And so even in a quarantine situation, your ego got to check at the door because yes. it's going to get squashed quick when Charles Biz posts four pieces in California <laughs> and you only did two. <laughs> yeah. You either going to grind or you going to fall behind. <laughs> and so yeah. what happens is that with that quarantine, we might have created a hundred pieces between the three of us in that amount of time, which is pretty amazing when you think about three three weeks of work. Uh, and we since then have done other versions of that project where we've incorporated uh, Deborah Shedrick and Grace Kisa and some other artists in different states to do. We've had upwards of four artists in each quarantine. We're looking forward to doing more of that stuff in the future. Uh, but tell me what it's like now that you've had a fresh chance to do it to actually collaborate on some stuff. Now, I don't know if a lot of y'all know, but uh, a, a few years ago, probably 1994 or something like that, between 94 and 7, I can't remember what it was, but LaShawn, myself, and, and another fantastic artist named Leroy Campbell, we were the first 
artist to do a three artist collaboration. That means we had to ship it to, at that point, I think uh, Leroy was in New York. Right. <laughs> he was in, uh, he was in at Texas and I was in Baltimore. And so we had, uh, came up with this idea to do this piece. It's called the Peacekeepers. Look it up on uh, theartofponcho.com, and you'll see that's a really well-known piece because it was the first time three artists actually did it, and it's actually signed by three of us. Mm-hmm. And it was amazing how much fellowship happened with us doing that one project. So, but that still wasn't the kind of collaboration that him and I have been working on this last couple of days, because what happened is that I was the architect of it, so I kind of drafted out what it would look what it could look like and then i left them total creative freedom to do whatever they want to do within that space so uh LaShawn was the second leg and then leroy campbell had the toughest part he had to squeeze his figure right in the middle of where my figures were and where LaShawn's figures were the piece really went well and uh today it's a real collectible piece but tell them what it's like to work in the same space with another artist on one piece on oh, several pieces. Not just one piece. <laughs> and uh, let me say this. You know, you know it's an experience uh, that's unreal uh, to be able to, to work with another artist like that and uh, to share that, that creativity. Uh, it's challenging, no doubt. What's the hard part? Man... Getting started once again. Yeah, but I mean, no, I know you got to warm up. You got to warm the car up first. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what I, was your biggest challenge of doing these collaborations? The biggest challenge was making sure that, uh, well, you know, quite quite frankly, you took took the hard part out for me because all I what I had to do is do the sketch, and then you came behind and did your thing on it and then I'll look at it again and see if there's something to add to it. So that flow flow easily. You know, that was that was effortlessly right there. So Well, you me, know what I found in the past, even with uh, all the artists that I work with, you're either a good starter starter or you're a good finisher. It's one of the two. And because I've done so many, I know how to start or finish. And so um once you get a, a kind of a cause you want both people's style of show. Um, you want to hopefully pick a medium that you're both comfortable with. Unfortunately, we both were kind of brave because I don't think either one of us liked the pencil too much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, out of all of the mediums, pencil for me is probably the biggest pain in the behind. Uh, I would agree with that. Yeah, so yeah. Um, when I do my studies or my, my sketches, I really am pressing that part of me because... Um, I prefer to paint, and I can clearly see this mm-hmm. dude right here. Y'all have y'all haven't seen him paint? He's like a machine. He's he's a technician, and so you get a chance to walk away from some of your crutches. You know, the big thing I like about doing uh, collaborations is typically you leave you're working with a set of materials that might not be the materials you generally work in. Mm-hmm. And because we wanted to kind of move fast, we use you know, even watercolor, which dries very fast, uh, acrylic. Uh, they are usually mixed medium, and they're usually done on paper. And so I encourage all artists to have a chance to really try to, to, to play with that medium a little bit. It just, spread, it just stretches your imagination a little bit uh, because none of us are drawn like we should draw. For all you young ones out there listening. True. If we can press ourselves to draw it, and so can you. <laughs> what do you think is the future, man, of, of what we're doing right now, man? What's been the impact of the web on what you're doing with your work? I mean, because the web has been, you know, kind of the direction I'm focusing on because everything has changed now. I used to service upwards of 3,000 frame shops and galleries from 1985 to 1999. Most of those galleries are closed because the Internet just came in just between that when the economy dropped after 9-11 and the housing market dropped and then the stock market dropped. Many of those shops closed. A lot of the folks that were a demographic lost their jobs. I mean, it was a real seismic shift for the art business, which I really don't think we've recovered from, to be honest with you. Um so to this this new market now is really being driven by online, and I, I'm a, I'm gonna be honest with you, I can't stand the online environment 
But you were either part of the the, the solution or part of the problem. <laughs> that's it. In a, that's it in a nutshell. So mm-hmm. you know you need to get aboard because you will be left behind. Uh, now, granted, there's there's always going to be a segment of the market that has to be that one on one, person to person connection. Uh, but what the internet does is allows you to reach a far vast vast market than uh, you can do on your own by foot. And uh, because you did, you across the globe. You know, there's there's no place that it doesn't reach. So if you master it then you open yourself to a whole new venue. Uh, but the key is mastering it. And there's and so many parts to it exactly. that we don't even know. We haven't even scratched the surface of the so, whole online environment. So for those of you that are just, you got your website and you're wondering why you ain't getting no business, there's so many things that go into it. Now let me explain something to you. This is the best time ever to be an artist. Yes, it is. The creator has made it so that if you are a writer, a musician, an artist, that you can literally get things done for a couple hundred dollars, man. Mm -hmm. It's just, if you don't want to succeed now, it's because you don't want to. But when the playing field gets equalized, that means everybody's running in the same game. So, like, most of y'all know, if you want to see some of the best art in the world, go to Facebook. You'll see some dynamite stuff. Flip side is, you want to see some of the worst art in the world? Go to Facebook, <laughs> and you'll see this this hodgepodge of everybody trying to get liked, mm-hmm. um, and most people who are being liked are not selling. And so, trying to, to monetize this new market is what most of us are having a challenge with. I mean, you know, if you can imagine, uh, the internet is like us sitting here in relationship to the world, and we got to try to get y'all to our site, okay? Mm-hmm. So you might think that that's everything, but it's not everything. Because now you got to find other ways to connect to people. That's why social networking is so important. Facebook, Instagram, or whatever else, whatever other ones you use. Twitter. I, those are probably the only three I use because I, I just don't have the time to keep up. How mm-hmm. do you manage keeping up with this stuff? Focus. You know, you have to, like, devote X amount of time to doing, doing everything in your business to, uh, to keep it going. What I like about you and admire about you as an artist is that you know, you're not afraid to get help. <laughs> you are hire somebody in a heartbeat, you know, and uh, to help you out with some things. But that is really the key is being able to uh, maximize your time. And you can't do that unless you're being very focused about and deliberate about what you're doing. Right. I mean, for me, you know, you I'm not going to stay on the subject of Internet law because uh, we'll be here all day. But what I can tell you is a couple of things. If you're not doing, you know, SEO or, or, or search engine optimization with mm-hmm. your site, it, it, people are not going to find you. But I'm going to tell you the biggest secret that nobody is going to tell you about right now what to do in the online environment to start tying that stuff together. Because some of you have a Facebook page you're not managing. But a lot of y'all just straight up social snobs. So artists are primed to be social snobs because we're really individuals. So to get the notion of getting in an environment of people is kind of already strange for us. Uh, but the reach is incredible because it's a 24-7, 365 days a year. So if you are a snob, get over yourself. You're not going to survive. If you haven't got, if you're apprehensively getting in, then you're going to get left behind. And I watched the whole industry get left behind because yes. they didn't want to deal with this, exactly. this entity, this thing. Exactly. So yep. uh, you got to do it. You got to learn as much as you can. And I don't know nothing compared to what's out there. Uh, Wikipedia. Most of y'all are not on Wikipedia. And when I say most of y'all, I'm talking about all of the artists. That's the next thing we got to do. Wack, still on it. He's on there. Charlie Palmer's on there. I'll give you a host of other artists that have made that move. All of us need to make that move. Because times are changing. So now mm-hmm. Wikipedia is ranking higher than Google. So right now, if you were getting a Wikipedia posting... Your, your name will come to the top of the search engines every time, but it's com- it comes at a cost because it's not like you can just go do that. It's like the internet environment, you got to hire professionals to understand that environment. Well, you got to do the same thing with Wikipedia. There's a, a language and an environment with Wikipedia that most of y'all can't do. <laughs> you either got to find a company that does it, which is what I did, or you have to have somebody knowledgeable of how that environment works. So um, that's my biggest tidbit for y'all on this whole 
uh, how to tie the internet thing together. And uh, uh, we're going to be talking about that kind of stuff more in the future right, right. when it comes back through. But uh, tell them about what you're trying to do now with your home shows. Well, for me, uh, my uh, business model is you know taking it taking it to the people, and uh, but being very more a little bit more personal. So I'm choosing to do um, home shows and, and taking that across the uh, the country and. and uh, yeah, because he's a long ways away from Baltimore. I'm a long way Dude, from Baltimore. Said, how many hours? Uh, <laughs> that's about two days. Two days. I drove to driving. Houston one time. That will be my last. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just. But, we want. Let me tell you, it's so worth it, though. I mm-hmm. mean, the connections I've made this trip uh, have been great. This whole trip has been fantastic for me so far. So. Um, it allows you to do several things. It allows you to connect with uh, some of your previous clients. It allows you to connect with uh, some of their friends, which is in the same age bracket. But also allows you to connect with the younger generation. The gen- generation that if you're of my age, and your age, you're not connected to. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, So if you're trying to figure out how you need what some ways to get connected with them, it's that one-on-one connection via... Their their uh, parents and aunts and stuff that allows you to do that, mm-hmm. and and that's happened for me on this trip. Mm-hmm. And you know, I've, so I've made some new customers based on that alone. So another yeah. important thing too is that artists have to work together. It's crucial. We have to, right, we're at a point right now where if we don't, we all lose. That's you know? true. And so just in a couple of days, we've been able to throw ideas back and forth where we're failing. Mm-hmm. Where we're succeeding, what we think is uh, is the next move, and and you know it's it's uh, valuable information I couldn't really get from anybody else. So yeah. I'm challenging all artists to start pairing up, tripling up. Uh, I got a my guy in California, Charles Bibbs, is my best working partner. Mm-hmm. I mean, we we get together two three times a year to reassess what we're doing in our business, and I'm glad that Lashawn is of that mindset because a lot of artists still aren't of that mindset. True. They're trying to go alone, which like everybody else in every other industry is trying to go alone, but what I'm saying to you is that it don't have to be that way. No. So use us as an example. We're working together. We're figuring out what the next page is going to be. We're going to share as much information as we can. Yes. Anything you want to say before we sign off, Mr. Beal? Listen, to all my artist friends out there, all your aspiring artists, I just can t- say to you, continue to create, create, create. He just took it out of my mouth because most of y'all are thinking more than you're working. And thinking is actually doing nothing. I'm going to sign off for right now. But till later, peace out and stay creative.